uh, ladies and gentlemen. COVID-19 has changed the world. It has not only killed hundreds of thousands of people in the last few months, it has also devastated the livelihood of billions across the world. Most importantly, COVID has damaged the world's confidence in the future. Planning and policy making would no longer be the same. Now, every strategy would have to be qualified by scenarios. Today, we have an opportunity to hear Mr. Singh on how our economy can recover from the pandemic's impact and how this will change, or uh, the shock will change the government's behavior. It's my pleasure to invite uh, Mr. Singh to address this council. Um, I, you know, uh, Mr. Singh actually needs no uh, introduction. Uh, he was the Revenue Secretary, Expenditure Secretary in Government of India, also Secretary to Prime Minister of India. Uh, before taking charge of the 15th Finance Commission, you chaired the Fiscal Responsibility and Budget Management Review Committee. You also in the Rajya Sabha, during which you contributed to several prominent parliamentary standing committees, including the Public Accounts Committee, Committee on Foreign Affairs. You were part of the core group that shaped India's economic reforms in 1991, and you were the principal interlocutor with the negotiations with the World Bank and the IMF. Uh, you're an outstanding economist and an academician. Uh, you're a member of the governing board of uh, Nalanda University. Uh, you've been a guest lecturer at Columbia, Yale, Stanford universities, and also the London School of Economics. You've also written several books, including Politics of Change, Not My Reason Alone, and The New Bihar. So we're looking also for your forward to your autobiography, uh, which is expected to be out in December. So it's a pleasure to have you uh, with us. Uh, with that, I hand over to you, uh, Mr. Singh. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to renew my association, which you know has had a long history. I have been a regular participant and attendee. Many of your IMI functions uh, in the past, uh, although for the last few years, given my uh, other engagements in the Finance Commission, I somewhat lost touch. So it's a real pleasure. Thank you, Mr. Kirloskar. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to once again uh, say uh, hello to all my old IMI friends and associates and others who have spared the time to join uh, today. Now, I tried to think on uh, what should be or what could be a possible focus of uh, some observations that uh, I might want to make on the Indian economy in the context of the pandemic. Uh, first and foremost, it just what came to my mind was that in economics, we have always been following the Mundale Fleming hypothesis. We have always talked about what is known as the impossible trinity. Now, what is this impossible trinity in conventional economics? It is the inherent contradiction between a fixed exchange rate, a free capital movement, and an independent monetary policy. So, uh, the great eminent economist Mundale called this the impossible trinity. Uh, this is because if the monetary authorities wish to pursue an independent monetary policy, they have to choose between fixed exchange rate and the policy relating to capital flows. Hence the inherent contradiction. Now this got partly modified with many versions of the starting point of this impossible trinity. The latest I found was the that by Danny, the Harvard economist Danny Roderick, which has uh, conceived of a, a different kind of an impossible trinity. And this is the choice which he poses between globalization and the national economy. And uh, he says that this will pose a 
three types of choices. Either you restrict democracy or you restrict globalization or you globalize democracy. So I think that in a certain framework, in the altered context, Danny Roderick rephrased uh, Mandel Fleming's impossible trinity in this uh, three kinds of typology. As I thought over today's theme, I struck me that currently the policymakers face also a different kind of impossible trinity. And what is this impossible trinity which current policymakers encounter? This is the impossible trinity between managing and ameliorating the pandemic between issues of defense security and issues connected with economic revival. Why do I call it the impossible trinity? I call it because uh, I'll go into this in great detail, but all this is straight jacketed with the presumption that these three objectives need to be pursued within the framework of overall macroeconomic stability. So at a certain, uh, at a certain basic level, uh, it may be axiomatic to suggest that to address the pandemic, we need to repair the health infrastructure very significantly. I'll come to that in a minute. And that of course uh, uh, entails costs. It entails significant costs in the very short run. The reasons for which I, I will come to. Similarly, if you wish to significantly improve your defense capability in the short run, that also requires significantly enhanced uh, outlays for, for defense. I'll come to this issue too. And if you wish to really have a robust economic revival package, many have argued uh, that you need to relax some of the norms which you have on macroeconomic stability by way of uh, enhanced uh, fiscal support, uh, uh, much more tolerant, uh, uh, much more tolerant forbearance policy of the reserves of the central bank, notwithstanding the fairly significant steps which both the government and the Reserve Bank have undertaken. But uh, obviously, as you go forward, the issue of orchestrating the economic revival is an issue. So I see at some conceptual macro level that if you are really uh, kind of straight-jacketed by not wanting to abandon the norms of overall macroeconomic stability, uh, then I think these three represent the impossible trinity for India in the current context, comprising of managing the pandemic, managing the economic revival process, and buttressing defense capability. Stop here and then continue on the strands of these three. Now, when you talk of pandemic, I think that uh, you were absolutely right, Sanjay, that uh, the most uh, significant thing about this pandemic is its uh, uncertainty, volatility, and a path which we do not know, it has far from played itself out. And we therefore need to keep a very careful eye and uh, proceed with great caution when we deal with responses to the pandemic. Let me for the time being focus on the obvious response, namely the Indian health sector. Now, as I'm looking at the health sector in, uh, in some depth, uh, for since I have said earlier that unlike other finance commissions, this is a finance commission in COVID times and uh, there will be a very important chapter dealing with the health sector initiatives. But I'm struck by a few facts which I thought that I will share with uh, some of you. First and foremost, 
I am those who look at India's health will be struck by the fact of how much over decades, and it's not a matter of one year or two years, the Erstwhile Planning Commission and perhaps the UK government, at that time, how much the health sector was systemically neglected. How do you think of a country with this complexity and proneness to health disorder given our level of poverty? that the total expenditure on the health sector, both center and states taken together, is less than 1% of GDP. Clearly, by any peer group comparisons to other neighboring, even other neighboring countries, not to talk of large emerging markets, this is uh, an unacceptably low uh, public outlay of comprising of both the center and the states. As far as central government is concerned, comprises only of 0.3% of GDP, and the states, since this is a state subject, have really an expenditure of 0.6%. Clearly, this needs to be very, very significantly enhanced. And I must confess that uh, uh, the thinking is uh, along the direction, because those of us who heard uh, the finance minister's uh, unraveling of the 10 lakh crore package would have certainly noticed uh, a strong commitment of the government to raise the gross budgetary support for defense expenditure, which significantly tries to mirror what was there and part of the health policy of 2017, namely take it closer uh, to 2%, if not above 2%, which in, in some ways would try and push us to where peer group countries are. In addition to enhancing the issues of public outlay, there are these huge spatial and geographical distortions. Parts of India, where the availability of doctors, the thousand population, is not even one fifth of what it is in some of the more advanced states in India. So this, and they happen to be, unfortunately, the poorest states in India. They happen to be states where the pandemic just beginning to gather momentum and just beginning to almost explore, we do not know when. So the skewed up pattern in terms of the availability of the health workers within this framework of the budget constraint is another distortion which needs to be addressed sooner than later because this is an ongoing pandemic. Third, for a very long time, India was unfortunately uh, bedeviled by the existence of the, of the kind of the Medical Council of India, which was a kind of a debilitating influence on any significant supply-side response. And it took successive governments over decades, to at long last, just uh, two years ago, to repeal that debilitating act, to replace by a National Medical Commission. And that should free up at least the possibility, but there's much, there's a, there's a long way to go. For instance, to give you an example today, uh, why can't we, in order to emulate the immediate shortage of frontline healthcare workers, allow students uh, in the fourth year and fifth year of uh, medical colleges to be able to be, come of some relief in augmenting the strength of the concerned state governments for dealing with the pandemic. Equally, for the paramedical staff, I think that the, those who are in the final or semi-final final year nursing colleges could be done. So without too much immediate augmentation of resources, this is an area where I think that some changes in the regulatory functioning can improve a significant supply-side response even in the very short run. It, be a, it was a curious thing for me to, for instance, discover that part of the reason is that health by health, health uh, sector workers is not a very attractive, uh, is not a very attractive career ramp. Uh, for instance, even though the provisions existed in 1951, today there is no national health service. We do not have a national health service. And it is quite amazing that frontline healthcare workers are in effect contractual 
an uncertain future and unpredictability. So I think that we need to definitely look at uh, the creation of uh, a permanent service, the Indian Health Service, I would say, would be an important step forward. Incidentally, uh, in, in doing some historical work on the on the health in the health sector, I found that the first uh, concept of an Indian Health Service was uh, came in 1764, much before the British had arrived and much before it became a colony. And we carried on in multiple forms as, as the Portuguese and later the British did it. But certainly it was considered even at, at that particular point in time that a national health service would be necessary for a country of, of, of Indian science. So I think there are issues of public outlay. There are issues of spatial distortions. There are issues of uh, regulatory changes. And there are the issues of ensuring that uh, the healthcare workers find the health profession attractive enough. And all these issues not only demand um, the responses from the governance rubric, apart from financial resources, it requires to be addressed sooner than later, given the volatility and uncertainty of this pandemic as we go forward. When it comes to the second leg of this impossible trilogy or this impossible trinity, which I mentioned, the second leg I would like to concentrate on is India's defense capability. Uh, I, this is another area where the Finance Commission is currently looking at the issues connected with the defense uh, in some depth, because they find that the earlier Finance Commission have, for very good reasons, uh, left this entirely in, uh, for the union government to take uh, such initiatives as it considers appropriate, considering the fact that in the seventh schedule of the Constitution, uh, as far as the entry one is concerned, defense of India is entry number one. And logically, as it should be, it is the most important charge on the Indian government. But there are several issues. First and foremost, uh, are we spending enough on this? Are we spending too little as compared to our own countries? I myself have been a party and partner in various international negotiations. One of the factors by which uh, countries wish to judge you is are you having an excessive expenditure on defense, considering that the needs of development and poverty and, and, and uh, social sector are really staring at your face? Uh, are you spending too much on, on your defense capability? I think those debates are perhaps now in the past. The fact remains that by any comparisons for a country Given India's geopolitics and the problems of the geopolitical management, we certainly need as much to modernize the defense force by using far greater technology than we have done so far, as to give greater predictability and certainty to the entire defense capital expenditure. So we are looking at what can be done by way of ensuring uh, greater predictability and certainty on the capital expenditure of the defense, even while we will be looking at uh, how you can increasingly use technology, which can greatly enhance your reach and capability, not only through air power, but in multiple ways in which uh, you need not really uh, use so much of your valuable manpower uh, as where technology can find. So defense modernization, predictability to your defense outlays, enhancing capital expenditure are all issues, I think, that which must occupy high national priority. This takes me to the third leg in this trilogy, namely the economic reliability process. Now we do know uh, it doesn't require too much uh, 
analytic capability to know that uh, uh, even as we were seeking to improve, this pandemic really led, led to these enormous economic consequences by way of uh, uh, a lockdown, which uh, really brought about serious dislocation, both on the demand side and the supply side. And that therefore, it is no surprise that the World Economic Outlook in its last report said that for the current fiscal year, uh, we would be lucky to register uh, not a very sharp uh, negative rates of growth, uh, uh, certainly in nominal terms, e even in nominal terms, and certainly in real terms, it would be so. This is notwithstanding the fact that uh, uh, by the same logic by which Q1 and Q2 would, show, would not be uh, lofty performance to say the least, return in chief, I, I think that Q3 and Q4 of the current fiscal year, I believe there would be a very sharp V-shaped recovery in Q3 and Q4. Not necessarily because anything very fundamental has happened or may happen, but because of the sheer power that you are then on a low base and therefore monotonically by way of mechanical, you should see a sharp rise in Q3 and Q4. Nonetheless, the year as a fiscal year as a whole uh, would, would end in, in, the, in the negative trajectory. The issue is that what happens then in the period next year, uh, would uh, the consequences of the shadow of the global economic uh, depression, certainly it's more than a recession, would continue to cast a shadow, or would and how much of the recovery of Q3 and Q4 would be going beyond the base the correction effect uh, will also be visible in the next fiscal year. But even assuming that it is visible in the next fiscal year, the fiscal year which follows that, that is the real, real question mark of that having done away with the base effect of big movement low base, are the growth initiatives really a sustainable one or not? And my view, uh, in my view, that depends critically on five important issues, on what kind of growth trajectory we expect in the medium term. Now, assuming that uh, most economic analysts uh, believe that uh, India's long, India's medium term growth potential remain substantially impaired, uh, un un substantially unimpaired, that uh, one very simple way of calculating this uh, without going into detailed modeling is you look at the long term growth trends of 25, 30 years, we'll end up with a growth rate of around uh, 6.5, 6.7, perhaps even 7%. The issue is really that uh, is this 7% is this a reduction in the long term tension of, a, of what would be an ideal growth rate for India uh, of 8% or so, which many have talked about. Uh, because that, given the power of compounding, would then enable a very sharp reduction in poverty and in other, um, in other connected parameters on social sector and so on. But assuming, leaving that aside, the issue is what kind of a reform initiative will enable a fuller realization of India's growth potential in the medium term. And from this point of view, and uh, I wish to highlight five issues. First, it is no brainer that uh, without a well functioning financial system, no country's growth rate can trigger uh, rather substantial. I think an enormous amount of changes have taken place in improvement in the, uh, in the improvement and management of the financial sector. Successive reforms committee have gone into this in imparting the necessary requisite autonomy and so on, particularly the public sector banks. Uh, the Reserve Bank has played an exceedingly creative and I would say very positive role in trying to help prepare the balance sheets of the bank. The far-reaching bankruptcy insolvency act, which was introduced in parliament, 
was uh, we sought to replicate the Chapter 11 uh, features of the, of the US Act, uh, giving a kind of an exit policy which would be credible, has made an enormous progress. But as we go forward, I think that there are three important issues which will continue to stay with us as far as this repair, long term repair of banking and credit system is concerned. First and foremost, the issue of the ownership of the banks. Now, we do know the circumstances under which uh, banks were nationalized. And uh, we also know that the nationalization had enormously positive effect in uh, enhancing the reach and access to banking. The initiative of this government in terms of John Bhan account and direct benefit payments and so on have enhanced the credit and reach of the formal banking system. But the fact remains still that uh, the daunting objectives of the Banking Nationalization Act has proved uh, to be somewhat elusive, if not somewhat opaque. So without going into and reopening the debate on the banking nationalization, uh, I've raised uh, in that uh, case uh, just two small, two small and, and significant issues. So if government is to have ownership, uh, we need to have far more significant and decisive thing in a, a banking recapitalization plan. Uh, I think that over the next five years, there is a huge public outlook which will be needed to keep the public sector banks properly uh, properly and adequately recapitalized considering the erosion of which uh, non-performing assets of various kinds have been inflicted. Second, I think that we do need to have a more expeditious movement forward on what changes are necessary in the exact uh, way in which the banking, uh, in which the Insolvency um, Act really can deliver the necessary outcomes in the stipulated time frame which was needed. And what are the changes in the rules and regulations which would enable us for a much faster resolution uh, of the pending uh, bank cases, uh, which have continued to continue to have the malaise of what was popularly known as the twin balance sheet problem of the banks and of the corporate concern. And what kind of changes which are really necessary. Third, I, I believe that uh, when we uh, opened up India's economy in 1991, and uh, Sanjay was quite kind enough to refer to my role during that period, one of the things uh, uh, which uh, we opened up a lot of sectors uh, incrementally and subsequently, but one sector which uh, really did not receive and fundamental reform initiative by way of liberalization and opening up remains the banking and insurance sector. The banking and insurance sector continues to be uh, definitely uh, uh, an overprotected sector in the economy. And apart from improving the health, autonomy, uh, and the other changes in the public sector banks to improve the cost and the quality of financial intermediation, also look at how to open up this, this sector, which has remained uh, historically following the bank nationalization, somewhat, uh, somewhat uh, closed affair and should be visited by the same kind of uh, liberalization process, which the rest of the Indian economy has already mentioned. So first I said the repair of the banking and financial sector. Second very important area, and I must really commend some of the recent initiatives that the Prime Minister has lived up to his word, never allow a crisis to, to be wasted, but convert the crisis into an opportunity. He mentioned a couple of reforms which I regard as very significant. I see that the reform in the agricultural sector something which uh, really we have been trying to toy with for 20, 25 years, the Central Agriculture and Central Commodities Act, the Agriculture Produce Marketing Act, contract farming, long-term leasing. These have really received a new boost which would enable agriculture 
to be a, a very important pillar in the revival of our growth strategy. There are other issues. We all know those of us who have dealt, for instance, with the, with the power sector. We know that the problems of the power is distribution companies uh, and the, the, offending, the difficulties in being able to collect adequate revenue, with complex issues of regulatory capture, inadequacy of billing, tardiness in the collection process, bills of the GENCOs mounted up, the gap between the average cost of power and the average realization of power continue to uh, not, get, uh, not get aligned uh, except in marginal ways. And the power sector reform, which are some important initiatives have been taken, are also, are also, are also very worthy. So I think that deepening the reform process on the factors of production and on an important sector like the agriculture sector, uh, coupled with the other initiatives uh, in the Afghanistan Bharat, whose concerns the other sectors of the economy should occupy space. There are other important agenda to fully free up the restraints in factors of production on land labor capital, which we know, on labor, uh, an important decision was taken that for some states, for nearly a thousand days, uh, no labor law will apply. This is an anecdotal and, and, and experimental thing to see what kind of investment is triggered with this decision of this kind. And I'm sure that in a period of time, this will strengthen and deepen itself. So I think that the continuation of the important reform initiatives is, in my view, the central theme which must occupy us. Why do I say that? I say that because my last point in this process is all this has to be done within the framework of macroeconomic stability. What does that mean? Those of us uh, who have been engaged in this and mentioned about my, my chairing the Fiscal Responsibility Management Act Committee, which became part of the Finance Bill of 2017, which gives us a new fiscal framework, uh, broadly uh, brings out the fact that for a country of uh, India's size, uh, India's per capita income, uh, India's thing, perhaps uh, uh, ideal debt to GDP for the country as a whole should be around 60%. And for enabling the 60% to be reached over the medium term, it required a uh, fiscal deficit to be aligned towards this, this debt objective, and therefore defines. Now, the events which have taken place with uh, significant shortfalls in revenue, particularly, and expenditures classically are more inelastic. Uh, with revenue shortfalls and other kinds of slowdowns, the revenue targets have been somewhat elusive. So the, the fact remains that uh, fiscal, fiscal numbers have also not, not looked uh, particularly rosy. And the debt numbers have increasingly moved in the northward direction. Uh, and uh, according to estimates which I saw, uh, which are they are closer, much closer to around over 80%. People tell me the gross underestimate uh, this could be 85 or plus. I, I have no calculus to exactly do that. But the fact remains that uh, if we wish to manage this impossible trilogy, this has to be managed in a responsible macroeconomic framework. So while we do this, responsible macroeconomic framework, some of the pressures on each of the key components which I have mentioned, the component of the pandemic, the component of defense security, and the component of economic revival and economic momentum. They come into play uh, and it is at the cross junction and straight jacketed by this leadership's decision to do all this in the framework of continuation with overall macroeconomic stability. I must say that uh, I have been engaged in uh, India's economic reforms uh, for uh, a pretty long time. I would certainly say from 1991 in one form or the other. I must say this government's record, particularly the Prime Minister's uh, commitment to adherence to macroeconomic stability has been spectacular and unique. 
profligacy in public policy is anathema to the regime parties. So I think that the world recognizes this fact that India will not move in a direction which would make the macroeconomic stability framework in any way a very questionable one. Yet, given the kind of distress in which we are in currently, it is quite understandable that uh, people are saying that the fiscal package, which has so far been announced, uh, could have been more, could have been deeper, could have been differently crafted. I think on, the, on this, a last word has not been said, because as I mentioned, that the pandemic is still an evolving. The, 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 viral, the virus is very much there. What more responses will be needed? What, in what way this will be calibrated? is something on which uh, uh, government uh, all accounts has kept an open mind on the subject. But the fact remains that therefore this year, one can understand that uh, the fiscal and debt issues remain problematic. And I think in my view, this is not a year in which uh, we should look at uh, any kind of a path of fiscal rectitude. This is the year when we just concentrate on whatever it needs, to address the issues of pandemic, whatever it needs to deal with its humanitarian dimensions and the health dimensions, and whatever it takes to ensure that in India's uh, security and integrity is in no way compromised on account of any positive of the sources. And that I think that these two have to act in tandem because in the long run, uh, I'm always reminded of the famous equation Doma, when he talked about the fiscal issue, and what matters is R minus G, R representing the rate of interest, and G representing the rate of growth. So, you want to have really a stable macroeconomic framework in the medium term. Key factor in the key thing is G, G representing growth. This growth is contingent on the form initiative which has been taken, some recent as part of the addressing the challenges of the pandemic. These are ongoing, deepening, and these reform initiatives need to be not only implemented in the letter and spirit, these reform strategies need to be strengthened and new dimensions added to them. If G looks up, the R minus G will look up at problems of macroeconomic stability, which gives you much greater fiscal space on the other two contradictory uh, components of the trilogy will look uh, a much more manageable one. Stop here to say that, uh, you know, it is said that politics is about the art of the possible. Equally said, leadership is about the art think that this leadership is equipped to do this impossible one, which people call the impossible triology in our case, in India's case, the triology of the pandemic, of defense, and economic. Thank you very much for allowing me this opportunity to share some thoughts with you. I wish I am all the best, and I'm happy to answer a few questions, should they be interested. Thank you very much. Mr. Kilowska, you are on mute. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Singh. Uh, you uh, painted a wide canvas as you spoke about the impossible uh, trilogy or trinity um, our country faces, especially not having spent too much, it is defense. Uh, but, you know, I was very happy to hear that uh, our Prime Minister does believe in uh, wasting uh, a crisis and turning it into opportunities. So uh, there are quite a few questions over here. I shall ask uh, Mr. Sudeep uh, Jalan, our past president, to lead with the Thank you, Sanjay. Namaskar, Nanduji. Hi, Namaskar. 
always good to hear you only you could have presented and covered such a wide canvas from health to defense and the presentation on the economy so succinctly nanduji i am as much of an optimist as you are and i strongly believe that uh, recovery is around the corner whether it's in the third quarter or fourth quarter and the government has made some very bold statements but somewhere there is a feeling in industry that some it has gone on a pause it started very well and the monetary policy etc but in the last two months there have been no pushes whether it's a fiscal fiscal push demand stimulation infrastructure spend etc how do you advise the government and us on this subject well uh, it has repeated i i ended my last part of my comment by the way let me say ki it's nice to hear uh, you again and uh, thank you for the compliment but uh, so, so, then very important question you have asked uh, but let me say that i ended my uh, my remarks by saying uh, two things that uh, the pandemic is an ongoing the pandemic is far india's pen numbers of the covid positive death each day is uh, quite significant adding to so uh, that's the first thing connected with this is the fact that the government has kept its uh, all its uh, options and whatever ammunition uh, very much act at the appropriate time your view is that the appropriate time is now i'm sure that uh, this is a sentiment which uh, many in the government equally share uh, that the appropriate time is uh, perhaps uh, uh, perhaps now and uh, i can tell you that that there would be many the government is fully on and uh, is cognizant of the act sooner than later thank you uh, we have a few questions from the uh, chat so sum dua uh, wants to know that he says that while we talk about health and defense uh could we also talk about uh, rural and agriculture based economic effects uh, especially with reference to msmes yes i think that uh, i read today that the msme sector uh correct me if i'm wrong have uh, so far availed of uh, uh 43% of the 3 lakh crore package was announced i don't know how accurate these figures are but i read the cursorily uh, that more needs to be done for msme who will and are represent the backbone of the indian uh, manufacturing process uh, is undoubtedly true we need to definitely uh, look at the msa i mean with uh, much greater uh, uh, with much greater priority than we seem to be doing so some things have been done and therefore we shouldn't brush aside what has already been done considering the impact of the rbi accommodation policy uh, other measures which have been taken and by the way i i should have mentioned that many of you would have uh, i don't know if you really uh, paid heed to that part of the remark of the finance minister where the entire uh, framework or definition of msme has undergone a major change uh, for the better in terms of emphasizing uh, externality to scale i also feel that as the msme will become increasingly more decentralized 
And I think that the next big impetus in India for the growth revival would come from the agro agro processing and agro sector on which I think that it would be a very important driver of change in the next couple of years, which would improve farm incomes uh, very significantly, which would improve uh, total agricultural productivity in a significant way, and which would increase also, address the historic uh, uh, the terms of trade, which have been really not in favor of agriculture, significantly improve the historic uh, terms of trade distortions and make agriculture pay an important role. So as that sector revives, it's bound to have important multiplier effects on MSME's sector as a whole. So I think that in short, I would say that MSME deserves high priority. It is a critical component of India's revival process. Significant steps have been taken, which need to be deepened further. And coupled with this, some of the sector initiatives, some of which, which I mentioned, would also, I think, help as far as MSME sector. Thank you. Uh, as someone from the manufacturing industry, uh, MSME contributes uh, a huge amount, I mean, not only to uh, the national economy, but each of one of us, and also to our exports. Uh, we have uh, one of our other past presidents, Mr. Udesh uh, Kohli, uh, who would like to ask a question. I know Udesh very well. So yes, we have, I think, decades of association. Many Udesh, how, Udesh, how have you been? I'm fine. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Singh. Excellent well, to hear your voice, first, Udesh. Yes. First of all, I must compliment you for an excellent presentation and very valid point you have made. And I also admire your innovative thinking. If, if you recall, I was president of IMA in 2003, and we had set up a committee under your chairmanship. And that report, I think for the first time, highlighted the importance of demographic advantage which India has. I remember that. And that was, in fact, report was presented to then Prime Minister also that time. But uh, I, have that, I have that photograph of me, including, oh, yes, including yes. you being there. Yes. yes. Well, I don't have that. I'll be grateful if you send it to me. <laughs> I lost oh. that. But anyway. I, I, I will fish it out and send it to you. Yeah, yeah. But... But what I'm trying to say is that was such innovative ideas at that time, which caught up later on. And the, our present prime minister has highlighted many times this demonstrative advantage. I mean, we are really looking forward to a similar innovative thinking in your finance commission report also, because it's a very tough time. And we all look forward to some very innovative ideas from you. I only want to compliment you. No question, really. Okay. Thank you. And I owe you that photograph. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so since this past president didn't ask a question, I'll have another one ask a question, Dr. Juneja. Dr. Juneja, are you there? Rika, is he unmuted? Yeah, he's unmuted. Okay, I think. Uh, then we will wait for a little while. I'll take a question. Yeah, he's still muted. No, he's been unmuted. He needs to unmute himself. Yeah, he has not done that. Shubham, can you unmute him? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Juneda has joined from two uh, profiles. I have unmuted both. Dr. Juneja, would you have your question ready? Yes, now he's on. Please go ahead. Hari. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. He has unfortunately muted himself, Sanjay. You may go ahead with someone else. We'll come back. Okay. Uh, we have a question from a member. He says uh, I, he would like to know whether you believe the uh, uh, Mr. Singh, uh, one of our members would like to know whether you believe the Atmanirbhar drive and economic moves against China 
will give an impetus to our economic growth or will it be a short term irritant well i think that the philosophy of aatmanirbhar bharat goes beyond china because uh, if you ask me uh, no doubt the, the recent but time has accentuated uh, the process and has sharpened the focus aatmanirbhar chat is really a strategy whose philosophy and whose economic rationale is not it goes beyond the limited chinese challenge let me give you an example let me give you an example by the way that gave me as a surprise myself i had mentioned about the uh, about the defense sector um needing new kind of on initiative and the boost uh, i've dealt with it at some length comments one of the factors that our as far as the defense is that if you look at the proportion of expenditure on defense, a very high proportion of capital defense expenditure is uh, on imported defense equipment now over the years in spite of all the efforts have been made this has resisted uh, very nominal changes but this is an obvious area uh, we need to enhance our defense capability we also need to enhance the quality productivity dependability of our uh, with the private sector becoming a very active partner in being able to produce defense uh, equipments which are needed and which should be worthy to be really used uh, by the indian uh, armed forces establishment so the aatmanirbhar program i in my view goes beyond the limited chinese challenge it addresses a more fundamental challenge of creating gainful employment opportunities in this country and enabling really the indian entrepreneurs small medium and large to become important drivers of the indian growth process let me also say that to some extent this false distinction which has been drawn between india becoming protectionist and becoming an isolationist economy uh, instead of engaging more purposefully as active players in international trade is a false dichotomy i think that the prime minister himself the other day clarified while speaking to the uh, usibc us uh, india business council uh, that uh, india can, wants to be an important player in the global value added chain we have uh, no doubts that uh, arrangements which enable us to effectively be part of the global value added chain that the global value added chain uh, becoming a trigger uh, for uh, economic growth of india and other partner countries is a reality and for that we need to improve the productivity the efficiency and quality of uh, product of products uh, produced in india and the quality of services so i think that aatmanirbhar bharat is a basic tenet beyond the limited issue of the chinese challenge thank you um, now we have another past president mr kevel norya who would like to ask Hi, good afternoon, uh, sir, and uh, it's really pleasure uh, to have you here. You talked about bank uh, recapitalization. In the last five years, the government has recapitalized more than three lakh crore. And if I look at it now, post COVID, the requirement of recapitalization may go beyond another three to five lakh crores. What will happen is that the shareholding of the government will increase beyond seventy-five to eighty percent. in these banks and that's not what the government wants why don't we have a different model completely so these banks become more independent more professional and are able to manage their businesses much better there is a jp nike committee report which has not really been taken seriously by the past government why don't we bring that report in the picture and at least experiment with the top four merged banks uh, to take it forward and make these banks more independent and professional 
I think it's a very core question. Uh, let me say that uh, I followed all the banking reforms, uh, various committees report, uh, beginning from the, you recall the, one of the first ones who did it was the Narsiman Committee report. And the Narsiman Committee report was, then there was another committee report, the Tarapur Committee report. And uh, uh, Nayak, who had worked with me in economic affairs, also headed this committee. I'm broadly familiar with this uh, committee report. I, I, I don't disagree with you at all that bank recapitalization is not a panacea for the more serious ills which afflict our banking system. And much deeper reforms are needed. That is why, if you recall, one of the observations which I made was that post-1991, one sector which has remained comparatively closed has been the banking and insurance. And we need to have a fundamental relook as we go forward in improving the cost and the quality of financial intermediation. Now, if you are suggesting to me that uh, this is also inextricably linked with the issue of the ownership of public sector banks, yeah, this is an issue uh, which I think that uh, needs to be in, in public domain, needs to be dispassionately debated and engaged. Uh, and uh, policy makers need to look at this with an open mind. I, I, I read, I do not know, anecdotally, and I have no evidence uh, because this has not been discussed. Incidentally, on ba banking recapitalization, I don't disagree with you. I, in fact, uh, I'm having a separate uh, finance commission, having a separate presentation by the banking secretary. And we, have, we are in consultation with the Reserve Bank the needs of the banking recapitalization for the next uh, five years or so, which is the period of my award. Uh, but uh, uh, leaving that aside, I think that newspaper uh, analysis suggests that the issue sooner than later on the entire ownership structure of banks and in what way without outright privatization, uh, some other approaches on banking will improve the, the quality and predictability of financial intermediation uh, is a high priority area as it should be of the current government. So in short, let me say, that I myself said that banking reforms is the centerpiece for the economic revival and the catalyst for economic change. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next and the last question, uh, Mr. Singh, I believe you, are, you have to leave at uh, 1.30. So That's correct. So let me ask the last question. It's from Gauhati. Uh, Mr. Subhabrata Sarma says, practically we have found that MSAV manufacturing sector is badly affected. Most of the units are functioning in chains. If one unit of that chain, a supply chain, if one unit of that chain is not functioning, all other units are badly affected. And purchasing power of uh, people is also lower at this time and there is less demand. So do you see a revival of the situation within the next five or six months? Uh, let me say, I'm glad you are asking this question from Gauhati, uh, a place uh, very dear to me too, because uh, I have thoroughly enjoyed my, uh, among the places that as Chairman Finance Commission, I, I visited more than once in Gauhati. And uh, I've really enjoyed my visits to Gauhati. Uh, I have been in touch uh, with the with the finance minister uh, of, of, of Assam, who has mentioned about this problem of the, uh, him and Mr. Sarma about this problem of the MSC in, in, in particularly in, in Assam and Party Two. I, I'm uh, I did say in my earlier comments that the issue of MSME should not be viewed to be an issue which is only concentrated in a few metropolitan confederates, but it's an issue uh, which goes and affects larger, much larger part of uh, not only rural India, but in non-metro cities and uh, in various state governments. And I, and, and I agree that if what is found that the 
steps which have been taken for MSME, both by the central government and by the Reserve Bank, are found to be inadequate to bring about a revival in the productive efficiency of the MSME. These need to be deepened and these need to be addressed with the priority that it deserves. I agree with you that future of India's manufacturing process is inextricably linked with what happens to MSME, even though MSME themselves have to improve their productive efficiency, their technology, and enlarge their size to be able to, uh, to, be able to garner the benefits of the externalities of scale uh, for survival in the long run, because the march of technology will otherwise make these uh, increasingly more and more uh, uncompetitive. But uh, I agree that MSEDs do deserve the priority attention as a central feature and backbone of the India's uh, manufacturing process. Thank you, Mr. Singh. I'll now uh, hand over to our senior vice president, uh, Mr. Harshpati Singhania, to deliver the vote of thanks. Shubham, can you unmute, please? I'm unmuted now, I think. Can you hear me? Yeah. Better? Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Um, good to see you virtually, Nandu, uncle, and uh, good afternoon. I yes. have you. Well, you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. And I, I was, you know, particularly struck, you are looking as dapper as ever. Oh, so, no. मुझे तो लगता है आपकी लॉकडाउन में सेहत इंप्रूव हो गई है। You are looking, you are looking as as dapper and as ever and as wonderful. But you know, I think looking younger. Yes, that's what I say. You look better. But I I must say that uh, you you brought out very um, well this India's impossible, you know, trinity uh, and the and the challenges that we face as a country. And therefore, I don't envy your position. Uh, uh, at this juncture, as the head of the Finance Commission, to see how uh, we are able to resolve the several issues that you brought out. I would only say uh, one thing in, is that, you know, you and you made this well, that reforms must continue. And I would say we should use this opportunity uh, to of this great economic difficulty, as well as that of human life, to unleash even bolder reform, which the government has passed on, undoubtedly, but to continue this. We need to deregulate business. We need to see how we bring in uh, less, uh, make it much easier to do business and carry on business. We need to improve the competitiveness of Indian business. And you touched on some of the Fundamentally, they have to be in factor input costs. And last one is, is to talk about the short term of how best we revive them. Because supply side is a problem. It is the demand revival typically um, in the engine. So I don't want to continue this more, but thank you once again and on behalf of Atma to deeply acknowledge uh, your time. Uh, and express gratitude uh, for uh, for your being with us and giving a wonderful uh, uh, elucidation on some of the issues facing us today. Thank you, Nandu Uncle. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank all the best. All the best. Thank you. With this, we come to the end of the program. Thank you, Mr. Singh, for joining us. And thank you, Mr. Kirloskar and Mr. Singhania and all the others for their comments. Uh, Thanks all for joining us. We would be finishing the session now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.